Time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much. I just want to start off by saying Oski Wee Wee was a great game yesterday. Katz and Argos both played very, very well. And of course, now we're all on the same team because we're going to Hamilton next week to uh, fight for the Grey Cup against Winnipeg. So I uh, hope everybody that can be there will be there. But my first question this morning, uh, Speaker, is uh, to the Premier. We've just heard, of course, that New Brunswick is imminently going to be signing their deal for affordable childcare in their province. That means Ontario is dead last. We're the only province without an affordable childcare plan. You know, costs are sky high. Families are really, really feeling the squeeze. They could use some relief, some financial relief, and they could use some hope that we're actually going to get affordable childcare in this province. It's obvious that childcare is just not a priority for Premier Ford, but it is for Ontario families. So my question is, why is this Premier so unable or unwilling to get Ontario Question. families affordable $10 a day childcare, and why did they take so long to even bother to try? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Premier is very committed to getting a fair deal for Ontario families. We recognize childcare is inaccessible and unaffordable for so many working parents. That is the reality that families have faced for the last many years as a consequence of inaction by the former Liberal government. But our Premier is standing up for Ontario. We're working with the federal government. In fact, we met with them multiple times, walked them through our numbers, our methodology, and our asks which is for a larger investment over a sustained period of time so that we can finally make childcare affordable for parents in Ontario. Uh, that is with the federal government. They have our full, complete financials. We look forward to hearing from them so that, we, yes, we can wrap up a deal that reduces costs for moms and dads right across this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, here's a list of uh, successful child care deals uh, that are bringing real relief to families uh, across Canada and more spaces as well. Speaker, so for example, Alberta families are going to have their fees cut in half, cut by 50% in just less than a month. Saskatchewan families are going to see up to $2,000 in some cases more rebates retroactively until the middle of uh, this past summer. BC families are seeing thousands of $10 a day childcare spaces literally right now being developed in their province. In Manitoba, the ECEs are having um, their wages increased to $25 an hour as a starting wage. Quebec families, as we know, have long had affordable childcare in their province, and it's done wonderful things for their economy. Ontario families, unfortunately, Speaker, continue to pay mortgage-level childcare payments. With the cost of living now so high, Speaker, Question. why won't the Premier deliver the kind of relief that Ontario parents deserve and get a deal, get a deal for $10 a day childcare for our families? And the Minister of Education. Oh, well, thank you, Speaker. Indeed, we do want a deal, a fair deal, a deal that actually reduces price for families, a deal that really helps to solve some of the great challenges of affordability that families are facing, that they faced for 15 long years in the former government, where child care rose by literally 400 per cent. Now, I accept and agree with the member opposite. We need to, do, uh, we need to continue to work hard to reduce costs. Ult ultimately, the, the government, in our first budget, introduced a measure to reduce affordability, rather reduce costs and increase affordability for parents through the introduction of the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, which was opposed by the NDP and Liberals. We also brought in a plan to build 30,000 child care spaces within our schools, 22,000 of which are approved. That was opposed by the NDP and Liberals. And I appreciate that's incremental, but it moves it in the right direction to create more access for parents and ultimately reduces the prices given the explosive increase under the former Liberal government. There's more work to do. We've sat with the federal government. We've given them the data. We await their response so that we can get a deal that reduces costs and increases access and ultimately uh, changes the trajectory so that we can bring down prices for families across this province. 
in the final supplementary. Speaker, it's just absolutely um, obvious that what this government has done is dragged its feet. They've dragged their feet, and now we're at the last province, and we still don't have a deal. Affordable child care means money in the pockets of parents. It's money that will bo uh, boost the local economy, money that struggling families who have actually had a lot to deal with in the last couple of years might see some great uh, opportunity for things to get a little better over the holidays if this government had done the right thing. But instead of a deal, we have Premier Ford playing petty politics, negotiating in the media, fighting with the federal Liberal government. and. Of course, as I've already said, they waited months and months and months before even trying to get a deal. Why has this premier failed, just like the Wynne Del Duca government before his, Question. to get affordable $10 a day childcare for Ontario families? Order. Mr. Vichkation. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been working constructively with the federal government through this pandemic with one aim, which is to protect the families we serve and ensure we can get through the worst of this pandemic. That has been a hallmark of his leadership, working across party lines and across levels of government with one interest, which is to uh, defeat this pandemic and put it behind us. I think that is a strength in this province. He and I and other members of our government are working with the feds and making the case to them on an expedited basis to get us the feedback, get us the response that I think Ontario families deserve. Now that they have, now that they have the full data they requested, it is true that the Liberals created Order. a great uh, affordability crisis in this province, from energy to housing, and uh, no doubt childcare. That is their legacy. I agree with the member opposite. Uh, and what we're doing, and under under our government and our premier's leadership, is introducing measures to reduce costs and increase access, and working with the feds, uh, they aim to land a fair deal that finally brings down prices for families and ensures it's sustainable for decades to come. And the next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Uh, the Premier has consistently uh, opposed COVID vaccine certificates. In July, he said, and I quote, we aren't doing it. In September, he announced it's only temporary. He told Ontarians that the certificate program is going to end on January 17th. But COVID cases, as we all see, are creeping up. A couple of days now, they've been over 1,000 cases a day. Who knows what the new variant is going to bring, Speaker? So my question is, will the Premier continue the mandatory vaccine certificate program after January 17th? Yes or no? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. The reality is there's so much about the Omicron variant that we don't know about yet. We do know it appears to be much more transmissible than the Delta variant that we're currently dealing with, but we don't know about its virulence and we don't know about the effects of our vaccine uh, to withstand the effects of this Omicron variant. So it's too soon to say. What we are telling people to is to please uh, continue to follow the public health measures that we've been following for many months now, the physical distancing, the wearing of a mask, frequent hand washing and so on. But we're also urging any Ontarians who've not yet received both of their vaccinations, please do so. And if you have children between ages 5 and 11, please get your children vaccinated as well. That's the best work that we can do to protect ourselves against the Delta or any other variant of this virus. Supplementary question. I didn't hear an answer to my uh, question. The fact is that the certificate helps us avoid lockdowns. The science table advice was clear. Certificates help keep business open, and they encourage hesitant people to get vaccinated. Yet the Premier's take on them, on the certificates, are, and I quote, uh, that um, we are not going to have a split society. That's how the Premier frames it. Peter Uni, the, the, uh, Dr. Peter Uni, the head of the science table, said in November that that's a false frame. He said, and I quote, the point that it's dividing society is an absolutely invalid argument. Certificates are about uniting Ontarians in the fight against COVID-19. So my question is, why won't the Premier commit today to keeping vaccine certificates in place beyond January 17th? Minister of Health. 
our government continues to support the need for the vaccine certificates, it is very important uh, for people to be able to enter certain locations, restaurants and other places for their protection, the protection of other people as well. However, to, as to how, when it's actually going to be lifted, we have the plan that we put in place several months ago, but we do have this new variant. We do have Omicron among us right now. And so the same answer that I had for your previous question is we're planning to, to start lifting things, but if this Omicron variant circulates widely and if it's as uh, virulent as it has been in other jurisdictions, we are going to need to take a look at that. Dr. Moore has said that from day one that if there is a major change in circumstances, we will have to reconsider as we're reconsidering every step along the way. But right now, we don't have the pertinent information that we need in order to make a decision. I anticipate that will become evident Response. in the next several months as we see what happens in South Africa and other jurisdictions. Supplementary. Speaker, I find it shocking that the Minister of Health is standing in this house projecting the lifting of, uh, of these measures, and all that does, Speaker, is embolden the anti-vaxxers and let them know that they don't have to worry about getting their vaccine because the government's about to lift uh, the, uh, the measures. Look, the Premier needs to step up here and provide some strong leadership. Ontarians have been doing their part. The vast majority of Ontarians have been doing their part, but they need leadership and public public health measures to fight the fourth wave, Speaker. Instead, the Premier is pandering to the anti-vaxxers, as is the Health Minister, who support them. The head of the science table, Dr. Peter Uni, said this, and I Government quote, side come to order. I believe Government side come to order. I believe vaccine certificates actually work surprisingly well. That's Dr. Peter Uni, the head of the science table. So will the Premier do the right thing? the evidence-based thing, and announced today that he'll continue the use of vaccine certificates in Ontario. Stop sending Ms. Mc mixed messages. Mr. Hull. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I, I think it's really important that we be clear, because apparently the leader of the official opposition uh, perhaps didn't understand what I was saying. I indicated that we are following the science. We are following the evidence. We are listening to the science advisory table. We are listening to uh, Dr. Moore. We are listening to everyone who's advised them. That is why we have taken the position we have. That is why we set out our, our uh, road to reopen Ontario. But it was always subject to the caveat that if there is a situation such as a variant that we don't know about, we don't know what it's, what's going to happen with it, we'll have to reevaluate. That's what we're doing. We are waiting to find out what the data is, what it is that we're dealing with this variant, but we're continuing to ask people to continue to follow those public health measures, to continue to get vaccinated, to continue to get the vaccine certificate, because we anticipate we will need it for at least another several months, if everything is all right, Spons? maybe for longer than that, once we know more about the Omicron variant. So we are following the evidence and we are following the science in every step we take. Very prudent. And the final supplementary. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. New question. The member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, last week, the Auditor General's report showed that approximately $210 million in COVID-19 support was given to 14,500 ineligible businesses. Dozens of businesses in, my, in Scarborough Southwest, in my riding, couldn't get small, Ontario Small Business Grant due to numerous inconsistency in the process, lack of clear communication, and an unnecessarily confusing process, Mr. Speaker. While our community members and businesses continue to suffer, this government decided to close escalation and any inquiries about the grant and stop providing the support altogether. Now, will this government take responsibility for their mismanagement of the pandemic business relief program and address the ongoing concerns from small business owners regarding their applications? Thank you, Speaker. And to respond, the Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member opposite, and thank you for that question. You know, clearly, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, small businesses who are in our communities right across Ontario have been struggling, not just for one month, for 21 months through the pandemic. And that's why, since day one, in March of 2020, we provided supports over a $19 billion action plan, of which $10 billion was for jobs and people, and $6 billion 
of that for businesses. And Mr. Speaker, we acted swiftly to uh, defer rent and help with the rent payments, property tax, electricity rebates. We, uh, we provided uh, beyond that supports for WSI B premiums. Mr. Speaker, we were there day one for small businesses. We'll continue to be there for small businesses. And we've heard from many of the small businesses, and they said the support grants that we provided them were often the difference between keeping the lights on and having them closed for good. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it's nice to hear those big numbers, but they're not going to the people of this province. They're not going to the businesses that need them. I don't know where it's going. Maybe this government can tell us where it's going. $210 million, people's hard earned money, was mismanaged. Speaker, I heard from Simon, a small business owner from my community, whose grant application was initially approved. He was even assured three times on the phone that his money will come soon. He was relieved that some support will be given to him during this difficult time. Speaker, months later, Simon received a rejection email with a list that he had never seen before for qualification. Simon expressed anxiety and fear of the future of his business. Anxiety for six months, and then he was denied of the support, Mr. Speaker. The, the Auditor General report actually highlights a lack of central tracking for business relief funds, poorly defined eligibility criteria, and exclusion of businesses who needed the support. We can see these issues clearly in our, pro in our writings, across all the members' writings, really, because we heard from so many different writings, including others in Scarborough Speaker. Why did the government allow a program that was so critical to small businesses, that was a lifeline, Speaker, for small businesses and for our economy, frankly, to be Question. grossly mismanaged, causing uncertainty and fear for small businesses. Thank you, Speaker. And the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, what was important uh, through the second wave was to get money out the door to many of those businesses, and I'd remind the member opposite that over 100,000 businesses received mm -hmm. support. Mr. Speaker, many of those businesses were struggling and continue to struggle, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, that many, many are support. struggling to this day, and that's why this uh, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health is encouraging everyone to get vaccinated in this province. In fact, we developed the Verify app so that businesses could go to 100 per cent capacity safely uh, with double vaccinations as proof of vaccination. Mr. Speaker, we continue to be there for small businesses. We'll continue to provide the supports from small businesses, and we'll continue to support the families and hardworking people of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Ontario students and parents deserved so much more than what they received for 15 years under the previous Liberal government. And we know what their track record was, closing 600 schools across the province of Ontario, the most expensive childcare program in Canada, and the cost of living rising at a dramatic rate, undermining the interests of middle class and working families in the province of Ontario. Ontarians deserve a government committed to improving flexibility and affordability and building new schools. Following school closures and repair backlogs province-wide, we need to see substantial investments to ensure Ontario remains a leader in world-class learning. New, modern and connected schools remain critical to the growth and learning of young people across this province. So, Speaker, through you. Can the Minister of Education tell this House what steps he is taking to ensure a continuity of innovation and excellence for Ontario learners? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Brantford Brand for the question. Uh, I very much agree that Ontario families and students deserve modern schools that are accessible, internet connected, with the high standards of air ventilation. I'm proud that under our Premier's leadership, we are investing over $1.5 billion in capital projects supporting 76 next new schools being added to our province, as well as 43 major additions. This represents 26,000 spaces underway within our schools, expanding them for the benefit of children. Today, there are 105 projects, construction projects underway, 350 approved 
uh, in the province of Ontario, and it's going to make a big difference. Nearly 100,000 more student spaces are being added to our province as a consequence of our investment in partnership with the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of Finance, and so many others to build this province, build spaces, build Fine. schools, build modern childcare after a decade of neglect and closure under the former Liberal government. There's more work to do, Speaker. We're going to continue to invest to build new Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his response. To build these schools and childcare spaces, our province will continue to rely on the skill and expertise of skilled trades professionals. A report by the Apprenticeship Youth Advisors called for the government to recognize the invaluable contributions that skilled trades make to our infrastructure, all while providing good-paying, lifetime jobs for, to youth. Mr. Speaker, we know that for too long, skilled trades were neglected by the previous government and were framed as less than a university degree. More also needs to be done to erase the stigma associated with skilled trades careers so that young people and their parents recognize that the trades are a pathway to success. Skilled trades training for youth will be key to meeting the labour demands of our generation, including building schools, all while providing quality pensions benefits Question. and pay to those in the industry. So, Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell this House that what the government is doing is doing, working with schools across the province to encourage engagement in the skilled trades? Thank you, Speaker. I again want to thank the member for his question and for his leadership in getting childcare spaces approved in his riding just weeks ago uh, in the Catholic school board system. But, Speaker, we know by 2025, one in five jobs will be in the skilled trades. We're also aware, Speaker, there's a 100,000 person shortfall today. And so we have to take action. This is why the government, in partnership with the Minister of Labour, has been working since day one to fill those gaps with qualified young people to fill those rewarding opportunities. We announced a $90 million investment in the skilled trades. We've expanded the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program with the aim of bringing roughly 63 recruiters literally into our high schools to recruit, to incent, and to create meaningful pathways for all students in the province, particularly women, racialized children, Indigenous and others who are underrepresented within these exciting careers. Speaker, we've also expanded uh, investment within our school system and in our curriculum, starting in, in kindergarten, literally, to inspire young people to pursue these careers. We're going to continue to invest and continue to encourage more young people to enter these jobs right across Ontario. The next question, the member for Nickel Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister of Health. Critically ill. They can deteriorate unexpectedly. That is why the standard of care in our ICUs is one to one nurse to patient ratio. Registered nurse, registered respiratory therapists, and community members are raising serious patient safety concern about South Lake Regional Health Center in Newmarket Aurora. South Lake, like all hospitals in Ontario, have seen eight years of budget freeze or below inflation increase the rest of the time. They have adopted a team-based nursing model in their ICU. That means that now the one fully trained ICU RN monitors her patient, but she must also monitor RNs who are not trained in critical care nursing. That is not one-on-one, -on -one, Speaker. That is not best practice. Will the Minister of Health listen to the concern of her constituents Question. and act now to make sure that every patient admitted to the ICU gets nothing less than one-on-one? -on -one? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the to the member for the question. Our, our first and concern has been the health and well-being of volunteers throughout this pandemic, and that includes when they're admitted to hospital. So we recognize that, and that I'm sure the member opposite will know, that there are uh, concerns with respect to health human resources right now, and so we have made other accommodations, but always with the patient safety first and foremost in our minds. We are making massive investments in educating more nurses, more uh, locations in our colleges and universities. We're training more people to become intensive care nurses, emergency nurses, surgical nurses, uh, but that doesn't happen overnight. But whatever we're the uh, health human resources we're putting into intensive care, the people of Ontario can rest assured that they will receive excellent quality care in nursing and any other uh, resources that they need. Response. That will happen through the pandemic and uh, thereafter. The supplementary question. 
It takes three to five years of intensive care experience to become an ICU nurse, or the successful completion of a critical care course in the last two years and critical uh, care experience. But at South Lake Hospital, nurses have left and continue to leave the ICU. So they are now hiring brand new nurses, some with less than one year of med surge experience and providing care to critically ill patients. How is this safe, Speaker? This is not, this is a cut to the ICU. This puts patients at risk. Nurses, respiratory therapists, concerned community feels like they are not being heard by their MPP, the minister. They want to know the concrete steps that the minister will take to promote retention, recruitment, and training of critical care nurses at South Lake and in every other Question. hospital in Ontario that provide ICU. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly uh, very pleased to respond to the question that the member has raised. We have been taking every step possible to uh, recruit, retain our qualified health human resources. The member is absolutely right that it takes several years in order to train someone to become a, uh, a nurse in intensive care, for example. We are spending those resources to do that, to make sure that we can have a program where people can be trained to be able to achieve that status. But at the other end, we're also training more nurses. But with respect to the specific question that you asked, there are always qualified intensive care nurses in intensive care. They will always provide um, uh, supervision of anyone who has uh, maybe not achieved that status. So there are qualified professionals in every aspect of our health care system, including intensive care with the appropriately trained nurses. Response? And that will always continue. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. Um, Mr. Speaker, and I listened very closely to the answers that the Minister of Education gave to uh, the question just a moment ago. And uh, I give credit to the government for its focus on skilled trades. I think that it's an interesting um, expansion into experiential learning. I think it's important. But given, Mr. Speaker, that this government has consistently proclaimed that it's a government that is intent on building Ontario's economy, it's, it's really inexplicable that it has consistently undermined the publicly funded education system, which is the single most important invest in, investment in a future uh, strong Ontario economy. As soon as this government was elected, it demonstrated its disdain for publicly funded education by cutting staff, setting untenable class size increases in both elementary and secondary schools in order to cut millions of dollars from the system, cutting Question. student aid for university and college students. And when COVID hit, this government dragged its heels and then the investment was well short of what was needed. Now there's a child care deal on the table, Mr. Speaker, from the federal government that has not been available to any governments before. Why has this government not signed the child care deal with the federal government? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do know that the Premier has increased investment every single year in public, publicly funded education, the highest levels ever invested in the pro history of this province, Speaker, in sharp contrast to the former Liberal government that you know, perhaps increased investment but didn't get a good return on that investment. Young people couldn't pass their grade six math average, 600 schools closed, and we created a massive deferred maintenance Order. backlog where the standard of our schools simply regressed by $16 billion. Unacceptable. We appreciate that, which is exactly why we are investing over $590 million more million this year within our budget to improve the standard of within our schools. That's why we're investing half a billion dollars to build new schools. And yes, it is precisely why we're working to make childcare more affordable. I joined the Minister of Infrastructure two weeks ago to announce 3,000 additional affordable, accessible childcare spaces for families within publicly funded schools. Now, the former Premier is right. There is more work to do. I accept the federal government has a lot to contribute. 2.5 per cent today is insufficient. We're asking them to step up their investment. Let's get this deal done. Supplementary. I appreciate that the government has continued the building of the 100,000 childcare spaces that had already begun under our government. I appreciate that. I think that's a good thing that they have continued on that plan, Mr. Speaker. When we took over government in 2003, 68 per cent of kids were graduating from high school. When we lost government in 2018, 
86 per cent of kids were graduating from high school, Mr. Speaker. So, Speaker, this is the last question that I'm going to have the privilege of asking in 2021. And I sincerely hope that when we're back in the legislature in 2022, Ontario will have signed a child care agreement. We just heard statements in honour of the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. We know that there are many women who are more at risk today than they were two years ago because of COVID, and that child care is something that could help. Speaker, toddlers at home and their anxious moms and dads today are completely oblivious to the provincial election cycle. They don't know and their parents don't care how signing a deal with a, feder with a federal Liberal government will affect the provincial Conservatives in an election. They all just want Question. a safe, affordable child care option. That is what is on the table right now. Will the government come to a child care agreement with the federal government before the dawn of the new year and put the anxieties of those families to rest? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I think many families' uh, anxieties rose when they saw their child care bills increase by 400 per cent under the former Liberal government's tenure. That just is unacceptable, and that is their legacy. But, Speaker, we do recognize that the federal government currently contributes roughly 2.5 per cent of Ontario's child care funding. That is uh, in need of a significant increase, which is why we're at the table. We've met them many times. The Premier and our government have demonstrated our willingness and ability to successfully negotiate with the federal government, be it the Safe Restart Agreement, a $4 billion outcome benefiting Ontario families, or the federal funding that the Ministry of Transportation helped lead negotiations on the GTA subway expansion and the Hamilton LRT in the opposition members riding. We know we can get a good deal. We, of course, aspire to get one as soon as possible. We are not the obstacle here. We provided the information to the feds. We hope that they will respond respond in kind to land a deal that reduces costs, that increases access, and finally makes childcare more affordable for the people we serve. Thank you. The next question, member for Halliburton, Fort Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. As members of this chamber have already observed today, marks 32 years since the tragic events at Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique. I'm sure I speak for all members of this House when I say that it is imperative for the government to do all that it can to help prevent violence against women and to support victims of this horrendous crime. Speaker, through you, to the minister, what has the government done to provide support to women and members of the LGBTQ2S plus community who have been victimized by senseless acts of violence and abuse? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, uh, and for her important work uh, on behalf of her constituents. I'd like to assure the member and all members in this House that our government has been steadfast in our commitment to preventing violence against women and is taking action to address violence in all forms against all genders. And this year, Speaker, our government is investing $202 million on important violence against women initiatives. These dollars will fund emergency shelters, counselling, 24-hour crisis lines, safety planning, child wellness programs, child, sorry, excuse me, I'll correct that, child witness programs, transitional and housing supports, and much more. We're working across government and across jurisdictions to stop violence against women and to end human trafficking. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for her response. And I'm pleased to hear that the government is committed to addressing this issue and taking concrete steps to protect the people of Ontario who are at risk. With my supplementary, I'd like to focus in on one particular horrendous form of violence against women that overwhelmingly impacts vulnerable women and girls, and that is human sex trafficking. As I'm sure the Minister knows, a disproportionately large number of the women trafficked are Indigenous, racialized, and young, underaged women and girls who are particularly vulnerable to offenders. Can the minister tell the House what the government is doing to prevent another incidence of this terrible crime? Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Halliburton, Kawartha, Lakes, Brock. As the member will know, last year our government launched our five-year strategy to combat human trafficking and sexual exploitation of women, children and at-risk youth. This comprehensive $307 million action plan is focused on raising awareness, protecting victims and intervening early, supporting survivors and most importantly holding offenders accountable. 
Speaker, our government is committed to working across jurisdictions and with all members of the community to ensure a multifaceted approach that provides more education, more prevention, more protection and more support for survivors, especially children. The issue of violence against women and girls is one that demands every single one of us to work towards change. And I can assure the member and this House that our government is committed to doing our part. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kiewetnaw. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Last week, uh, the Auditor General released uh, their 2021 uh, annual report. We have a, uh, an agency under the Ministry of Environment with a mandate to improve drinking water in First Nations. In Kiewetnaw, there are 14 First Nations under long-term boil water advisories, including Skanaga, who is almost at their 27 years of anniversary of living with no clean drinking water. Speaker, uh, it is shameful that governments, including this one, enables this structural racism, or you can call it racism, period. Why is it that uh, the government refuses to step up to ensure all Ontarians have access to clean drinking water, no matter where they live? Miigwech. To reply on behalf of the government, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. Um, that member's right, and I appreciate that question for too long. Uh, this has been simply unacceptable, the reality of challenges in getting clean drinking water in First Nations communities. That's why our government's working closely with Aqua and Walkerton, agencies of government, uh, collaboratively with First Nations and the federal government to support resolutions to long-term drinking water advisories. We know that Indigenous Services Canada provides funding for First Nations for water and wastewater services on reserves, 100% uh, for design and construction, and 80% for operating and maintenance costs. First Nations are not mandated to meet Ontario's regulatory framework, as this is a federal, federal government lead. However, we're not stopping with that. That's why Aqua is working closely with a number of Indigenous communities. That's why, um, working collaboratively with the Auditor General, Aqua Once. is launching, for the first time under this government, both a mandate to Walkerton to work with Indigenous communities and an Indigenous advisory circle that will be Indigenous-led to work to improve water quality on First Nations communities. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, in the report, the Auditor General stated that the uh, Ontario Clean Water Agency is hesitant to support First Nations struggling with boil water advisories. Apparently, the, they are hesitant because they need to achieve full cost recovery. I didn't realize getting people clean drinking water was only important when there was money to be made off it. Speaker, uh, leaving people to live their whole lives under boy water advisories is nothing to be proud of. When will Ontario begin to subsidize these technical services so they can help more First Nations in Ontario under Boil Water Advisories. Minister of the Environment. Thank you. And again, I thank the member opposite for that question. Uh, Aqua is in First Nations communities around Ontario, regardless of whether they receive cost recovery or not. That cost recovery is given to the Indigenous communities from the federal government. And quite frankly, under my leadership as minister and under this premier, we don't care. We will be there to support regardless of the reality. That's why. Aqua has been in the Skanjiga on a 24-7 basis since November of 2020. We will continue investing in Aqua and Walkerton to work with Indigenous communities. We will continue working with Aqua. I recently just met with the chair of their board and uh, who reported uh, to me that they are well on their way uh, with the Indigenous Advisory Circle that is Indigenous-led. It's a principle I learned when at the Royal College, never about us without us. That's why we're working uh, with the Indigenous communities. That's why 
We've launched an Indigenous-led advisory circle. We will always respond and work in close collaborations with Indigenous communities across the province. And I appreciate that member's question. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Nurses are at a breaking point, overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated. The ONA says that hospitals face an 18 to 20 percent nursing vacancy rates. ICUs have reduced capacity because we don't have as many nurses to staff them. The surgery backlog is worsening because we don't have enough nurses to staff operating rooms. The nursing shortage is putting pressure on our health care system, affecting patient care. Ontario desperately needs a plan to retain nurses to shore up our health care system, and that starts with fair wages. So, Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing, show nurses the respect they deserve, and revoke Bill 124 so they can negotiate a fair wage for the services they've provided Ontarians? And to respond, government has speaking. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As uh, has been mentioned on a number of occasions uh, in this House, uh, we understand that is why the Minister of Health has been putting so many, re so much resources into rebuilding the healthcare system across the province uh, of Ontario. Uh, Bill 124, uh, of course, is an opportunity to ensure that we save jobs across uh, across the province of Ontario. But it hasn't stopped us from investing and in working with the Minister of Colleges uh, and Universities to ensure that we bring in. Uh, more new nurses. I think we're ad adding some additional 2,000 uh, new nurses, uh, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, as we build out more ICUs, as we build out more critical care beds, as we build out 30,000 additional long-term care units, the investments that are being made, at, uh, historic investments, frankly, in Brampton and, uh, at, and in Mississauga with the uh, with the Peel Hospital, we understand how important it is to bring on uh, 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 new nurses, uh, uh, Speaker, and not only new nurses, but PSWs at the same Response. time. Uh, so there is a lot of work uh, to be done, Mr. Speaker. We're making the investments in order to uh, to get this uh, this work accomplished. Thank you. Supplementary question, Speaker. What the government needs to understand, and I believe the people of Ontario understand, that you can build more physical space. You can expand physical capacity, but if you don't have the people, the people to work in those hospitals, in those operating rooms, in those ICUs, you're not going to be able to provide the health care that Ontarians need. On November 14th, the Registered Nurses Association called on the government to revoke Bill 124 within 30 days so nurses could get the pay raise they deserve because, frankly, freezing their wages with today's inflation rate is the same as a pay cut. So, Speaker, the clock is ticking. The 30 days are almost up. Will the government Question. listen to nurses, show them the respect they deserve, and revoke Bill 124? Thank you. Government House Leader. It, uh, uh, as I said, Bill 124 is about preserving jobs uh, uh, across the public service, uh, Speaker. It doesn't, of course, uh, restrict individuals who, uh, who receive uh, uh, promotions within their category from receiving those, uh, that augmented pay. But what we heard a lot of the time, too, Mr. Speaker, was the fact that uh, the lack of investments uh, being made by the previous government in terms of, of our hospitals uh, was causing people to leave the province. We saw that so often with our doctors, with nurses, Mr. Speaker. We did not have the facilities that were keeping in attracting the tops and the best and the brightest back here. So that's why these investments in, in a Brampton hospital, the investments that we're making in Peel, the investments that we're making uh, in Niagara, the investments that we're making in long-term care are so important to bringing the best and the brightest back to Ontario and keeping the best and the brightest here, Mr. Speaker, because I agree with the Honourable Gentleman. It's not just about uh, wages. It's not just about uh, uh, building these facilities. It's about investing in the top-notch quality Spons? health care that the people of the province of Ontario demand, and we're finding Finally, getting that done. And the next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we all know Ontario is in a housing crisis. Young families, seniors, and hardworking Ontarians are desperate for housing that meets their unique needs. The previous Liberal government sat on their hands for 15 years and said no to addressing the housing crisis. In 2020, the year after our Housing Supply Action Plan was implemented, Ontario had the highest level of housing starts in a decade, 
and the highest level of renter st starts since 1992. But we all know there is more to be done. I understand that this morning the minister announced that our government is cutting red tape in the city of Guelph. So, Speaker, th through you, could the minister tell us how this will lay the groundwork for future development as much as Question. much of it needed for housing, and how will the government protect the city's drinking water supply for years to come? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the honourable member for that uh, for that question. Uh, I was uh, pleased to be in Guelph this morning. I joined uh, Mayor Cam Guthrie to announce that uh, I'll be issuing a minister's zoning order that will speed up approvals to allow for the development of new housing uh, on the Dolime Quarry uh, in lands in the township. Also, uh, we'll be protecting uh, valuable drinking water uh, for the municipality, just like all other minister zoning orders issued on non-provincially owned land. The MZO comes at the request of City Council. Together uh, with our local municipal partners, our government is using the MZO tool to get critical projects in the ground faster, things like affordable housing, uh, health care facilities, long-term care. We need to move at a pace that Ontarians deserve. The announcement today demonstrates our Response. commitment to ensure that critical local priority projects can be built as fast as possible. I'll have more to say in the here, supplementary here. speech. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for his response and sharing that information with the House. Speaker, I'm pleased that our government is using the MZO tool to speed up critical projects such as much-needed housing, long-term care beds, and even hospital expansions, all while ensuring the local municipality remains in the driver's seat the entire time. And while I understand the minister has already fast-tracked 3,700 long-term care beds and created over 46,000 jobs through the use of ministerial zoning orders, the citizens of Guelph are depending on our government to not only offer up new opportunities for housing, but also protect Guelph's drinking water. Can the minister, through you, Speaker, tell us what this announcement means for the current and future residents of Guelph? Mr. 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 Well, another great question from uh, the member for Oakville. Uh, as uh, he stated, uh, this is a partnership between the city. We're using the minister's zoning order tool to protect the drinking water for the people of Guelph. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is saying yes. As the member mentioned, we're saying yes to building more homes. We're saying yes to expanding our health care facilities and our long-term care capability. We're saying yes to protecting our environment. When Guelph City Council requested the MZO to cut red tape, to clear the way for new development that will also help protect the city's drinking water, our government was pleased, Speaker, to say yes. I'm proud that this initiative shows that there's a balanced and responsible approach to growth for our government. It protects the natural heritage features, a pond and the drinking water source beneath the quarry, alongside the future creation of housing. This is a fantastic announcement for the people of Guelph, unlike the Liberals and the NDP, who always say no. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Earlier this month, I wrote a letter to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services and Minister of Health about an important issue raised by one of my local constituents. We're all still waiting for a response. When she went to renew her OHIP card using the online service, she found it was only available to those who hold an Ontario driver's license. This is exceptionally limiting for her as a person with a specific disability that prevents her from driving. The CNIB Foundation in my riding has also flagged this issue to the ministry over two years years ago, noting how this system requirement excludes people who are blind, partially blind, or blind deaf across Ontario. Speaker, with expired health cards no longer accepted as of February of 2022, what is the government doing to remove this barrier that disproportionately impacts people with disabilities? Thank you. Consumer Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member opposite for the question. Um, I want to be very clear, first and foremost, that uh, you can renew your health card the same way you always could renew your health card at a service counter at a service Ontario. That hasn't changed in any way, shape, or form. 
What our government has done with our modernization efforts, which we are very proud of as we continue to work towards modernizing Ontario, making sure that we have a process that is digital first, but not digital only. All of our cards, the health cards, can be renewed, and at the present time, there is a process that requires the driver's license to be used for that purpose, and we are working on trying to ensure, along with our great Minister of Health, uh, we have been working towards trying to ensure that there are um, additional ways that we could get our health cards uh, renewed, uh, just like all of the other cards. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I want to be crystal clear that the way in which you would have renewed your health card in the past process, and you could still do the same type of renewal processes that you always could, and we are just making it better, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, modern, modern, modernizing systems shouldn't leave people with disabilities behind. Uh, my supplementary question is again to the Premier. The CNIB, as I said, flagged this issue to the government over two years ago. So the delay, it's been a two-year delay, is frankly inexcusable in, in fixing this glitch. But sadly, this government doesn't have a good track record, frankly, with accessibility issues. In 2019, the AODA report by David Onley described this government's progress to meeting the 2025 Accessibility Action Plan as glacial. And in the over 1,000 days that have followed, there has been utter inaction. This government's failure to consider how the driver's license requirement would unfairly burden people with disabilities who are unable to drive wasn't just inconvenient, it is actually discrimination. Speaker, can this government explain what they're doing to consult specifically with disability advocates to lift not just this barrier towards full accessibility, but every other one, frankly, that still exists Question. in this province to meet the 2025 commitment? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, mentioned last week uh, in the House, I know that uh, uh, the minister is working very diligently on this. We understand how important uh, uh, it is uh, to have all communities have access uh, uh, throughout the province of Ontario, something that we have to work with uh, in conjunction with our municipal partners and our, uh, our uh, federal partners, uh, Speaker. Uh, at the same time, we recognize uh, the, the contributions of, uh, of Mr. Onley in that report. And as I said uh, last week, uh, uh, the minister will have more to say on this uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario had paid sick days for all working Ontarians before this government re reversed that right given to workers in 2018. During this pandemic, doctors, nurses, teachers, and countless others have asked this government to bring them back. Workers were going to work sick unable to afford taking time off to get vaccinated. Ontarians need paid sick days to slow the spread of COVID-19 and its variants of concern and to make it easier to get vaccinated. This government dragged their feet for over a year and the current program is set to expire less than four weeks from now on December 31st. Speaker, Question. does the Premier once again plan to make workers choose between a paycheck and their health? Will parents be forced to take unpaid time off to get their children vaccinated, or will this government do the right thing and extend 10 paid sick days to Ontario workers? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Liberals waited, as I said last week, 5,110 days to bring in sick days in the dying days of the previous administration. That's 5,000 days, Mr. Speaker. Order. Now we brought in, we brought Order. in. Uh, sick days. Working with our federal partners, we brought in uh, over 20 uh, sick days for the people of the province of Ontario. Sick days that can be used to bring your kids to get vaccinated because we know how important it is. We also brought in uh, job protections uh, right at the beginning, more, faster than any other government across this, uh, this country. We brought in job protections to ensure that anybody who was impacted by COVID had their jobs protected, Mr. Speaker. We are continuing to work with our essential workers because we know how important it is to keeping the economy going. That is why the Premier made it a priority. We didn't wait 5,000 days. We didn't wait for four or five different Response. administrations to get it done. Like so many other things, we're getting it done in our first term of office. And supplementary question. 
Well, Speaker, it's ironic that this government, this PC government under Premier Ford, took less than 200 days to cancel those same sick days. Shame on you. Speaker, in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, we have many parents who must work multiple jobs, long, extensive hours, and yet we expect them to be able to take their kids to get them vaccinated. The guidance that this government has provided to elementary schools acknowledges that in the winter, the virus is likely to spread more rapidly. Has the, this government updated its guidance since the Omicron variant? Seeker, we need to make sure that parents know that their children, regardless of background, regardless of, of, of circumstance, can get vaccinated. Only 21 percent of 5 to 11 have been vaccinated Response? to this point. Their question? Will the government act to make sure that, the, that they work with school boards to do in-school vaccinations for all students in light of the risk we are now facing with the Omicron variant, and we know that in the winter months, the transition is more. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hill. Thank you, and thank you very much to the member for the question. We know that with the threat of the Omicron variant uh, coming forward, we still don't know the details about it, but we know that we're still dealing with the Delta variant here in Ontario. So we're advising all Ontarians to please get vaccinated, first and second vaccinations for um, adults and, and booster doses as well. We've lowered the age now from 50 to 69 year olds. They will be able as of December 13th to be able to get their third doses. And with respect to children, we have over, uh, 226,445 uh, children already been vaccinated, 21% of the population. That's in 10 days only. We already have over 180,000 appointments booked, so we thank the parents of Ontario for taking their children to be vaccinated. That's the best way for us to emerge from this pandemic, and people are responding accordingly. We're very, very Response. grateful for that. and make the comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I want to talk about a constituent in my riding, a constituent who deserves respect of this entire House. His name is Bird Sisler. He's 106 years young. He's a Second World War veteran and a lifelong resident of the great town of Fort Erie. Bird has been trying to get into a long-term care home in Fort Erie for six months. Imagine, in this province, veterans can't get immediately get placed in a long-term care home in their own community. If anyone should get a bed in a long-term care home the day they need one, it's Bert Sisler, and frankly, any veteran in the province, in this great province. So my question is this, how can it be that in this province there are veterans like Bert who wait months for a long-term care bed? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the, the honourable gentleman is correct. It shouldn't be the case in the province of Ontario. It never should have been the case in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is why we get so angry when we talk about the failures of the previous government, which built 611 beds in the last two administrations. In over 10 years, they only managed to build 611 beds. To put that into context, Mr. Speaker, my own riding is building a thousand new beds in our first term. That is why we put a priority on building 30,000 new beds. That is why the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is being so aggressive in ensuring that we get MZOs to support over 37 hundred brand new beds, Mr. Speaker. All initiatives that the members opposite voted against, not only in our time in office, but when they supported the Liberals between 2011 and 14, when they had the balance of power, could have ended Bonds. the fiasco that were the last two Liberal administrations. They chose not to, Mr. Speaker, but on behalf of your constituents, we will get the job done. Well, back to the Premier. And I wasn't going to get political about Bert, because I don't think he deserves to be political right now. What he needs is a place to be taken care of. I visited his home just a couple weeks ago. His sons and his daughters are taking care of him. Bird, you know, when he was 104, he was still bowling. He had to stop because he couldn't go down the steps to the bowling alley. He's got countless trophies from bowling. He used to go to the fundraisers, to the fire hall, and he'd eat a full breakfast. And this is just before COVID. And I sat with him. I was amazed. He had three pancakes, 
He had scrambled eggs. He had juice. He had toast. And I ate my little part that I ate. He ate the whole thing at 104 years old. And you know, Bert was there for us in World War II, like a lot of veterans were. He answered the call. He went over there. He fought for his country. He fought for our freedom. He was there for us. And today, I'm asking everybody here, let's be here for Bert. Let's be here for his family, who have given everything to him. They love their dad to death. They just can't do it anymore. They can't take care of him at night the way he should be taken care of. So I'm saying to you, please, he was there for us. Let's Question. be there for him. What Bert needs is a safe, publicly funded, not-for-profit long-term care bed, which guarantees four hours of hands-on care every single day. Speaker, will the Premier immediately implement a plan to get Bert and veterans like him into publicly funded, not-for-profit beds in their communities for Bert and his family? Thank you very much. Speaker. Speaker, as I just said, from day one, it was so important for us because there are so many people just like his constituent who fought so hard for this country, who fought to build this country. You didn't just have to fight hard in a war. People like my parents who had come to this country and worked their tails off for generations, Mr. Speaker, worked their tails off and contributed. They should have access to the top quality health care that we demand. They should have access to long-term care. They should have the best education system. They should have the best transit and transportation systems. This is one of the richest communities, one of the richest jurisdictions in North America, Mr. Speaker. But on so many different ways, we have failed the people. That is why we set out right from the beginning to make those investments in the priority areas that were so important. Rebuilding health care, rebuilding long-term care, Mr. Speaker, rebuilding our education system, building roads, Fonts. bridges, Mr. Speaker, because we know that this province can be so much more than it was when we took office in 2018, so that we can honour people like him who fought so hard to give us our freedoms. Thank you. Member for Chatham, Kent, Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Earlier this year, doctors said it was okay for pregnant mothers to get the vaccine. And now we're seeing substantial rise in stillbirths. Speaker, to the minister, I, look, I'm only reporting what I've discovered. Here, what Trish had publicly stated it was a well known in the midwifery community that people opting for the jab have seen stillbirth rates rise exponentially. Speaker, we have heard from a hospital joint chief of staff stating that the rise in stillbirths is erroneous. Well, I've been informed by frontline health care workers who have witnessed this tragedy firsthand. They've mm -hmm. chosen to report these stillbirths to protect the public. We also know that CPSO and hospitals are muzzling staff. If these incidents are not being Gen reported properly, then in my opinion, it's medical fraud. So my question to the minister is, who do you believe, hospital administration or frontline nurses and doctors who are willing to risk it all? Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. Member for Nickel Belt has a point of order. A quick point of order, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate my colleague John Vantoff from Temiskim and Cochrane for becoming a granddad yesterday. Congratulations. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.